Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Chamberlain from Army Public Affairs. Today you'll hear from the members of the Fort Hood Independent Review Committee, Chris Swecker, Jonathan Harmon, Kerry Ricci, Keita Rodriguez, and Jack White. This briefing will last 45 minutes, ending no later than one. Before I introduce the committee members, I have several announcements. If you RSVP'd for this briefing, you previously received an embargoed press release along with an embargoed copy of the executive summary of the report of the Fort Hood Independent Review Committee. That embargo is now lifted. Very soon, you'll receive an updated version of the press release with a second release outlining the accountability actions Secretary McCarthy just announced. The Army's new Fort Hood Independent Review website Army.mil slash Fort Hood Review will go live shortly. On this site, you'll find both press releases, a link to download the 136 page redacted report, and additional background materials. This briefing will begin with an opening statement from Mr. Swecker on behalf of the committee. Afterward, the committee members will take questions relating to the report and their findings and recommendations. For the QA segment, Please allow me to acknowledge you before asking your question. Please provide your name and affiliation. Limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. I'll call on reporters in the room and on the phone line. I'll provide a warning when we have time for one more question. And now Mr. Swecker will read an opening statement on behalf of the committee. Good afternoon and, and thank you for attending today. Uh, my name is Chris Swecker. I'm the chair of the Fort Hood Independent Review Committee. I'm a practicing attorney in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm also of counsel with Miller Martin out of uh, Tennessee. Um, and I'm retired from the FBI after 24 years, uh, retiring as assistant director of the FBI. To my far left is Jonathan Harmon. He's chairman of McGuire Woods Law Firm. He is, nat he is a nationally recognized trial attorney who previously served as an Army officer at Fort Hood in the 1st Cavalry Division after graduating from West Point. Uh, to my immediate left in the front is uh, Carrie Ricci. She is a retired Army JAG officer who served three years at Fort Hood, including as trial counsel and is now a senior executive serving as an associate attorney uh, general counsel for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Just behind Ms. Ricci is uh, Keta Rodriguez, she is a retired Marine Corps officer who served 20 years on active duty. She currently serves as regional director for Four Block, which is a veteran serving nonprofit organization. To my right is Jack White. He's a partner at FH&L, a law firm where his practice focuses on government investigations and civil rights claims. He served as a law clerk at the US Supreme Court after graduating from West Point and serving as an armor officer in the active army and the U.S. Army Reserve. So after, after that introduction, uh, I'm going to read a very brief statement and turn it back over to Elizabeth. On July 30th, 2020, the Fort Hood Independent Review Committee was chartered by the Secretary of the Army to conduct a comprehensive independent review of the Fort Hood command climate and culture and assess its impact on the health, safety, and readiness of its soldiers and units, particularly as it related to preventing sexual assault, harassment, crime issues affecting soldiers, and missing soldier protocols. We began our work immediately. The committee members who had never met each other prior to their appointment were, asked, were tasked to organize themselves, devise a strategy for the review, gather relevant facts, and complete a final report to the secretary within 90 days. All of the members have day jobs with significant responsibilities. We couldn't cast those aside. However, we accepted this appointment based on our shared belief that an independent body could indeed assess the serious issues at hand and, if necessary, provide a roadmap towards constructive change. Each member of the committee accepted this appointment with the intention and a, and a hope of supporting the mission and well-being of our brave soldiers. The final report was delivered to the Secretary of the Army on November 6th. We briefed the Secretary of the Army and the Army Command on November 18th of this year. Before we go any further, let me emphasize that the Secretary, Secretary McCarthy, 
Under Secretary McPherson and Chief of Staff McConville provided us absolute independence to do our job. We were authorized access to every available source of information and we were provided a full Army staff including a Brigadier General, two Colonels, several Lieutenant Colonels, and a Master Sergeant, each of whom stood ready to support our mission. Although the establishment of an independent committee of civilians to review U.S. Army command and its actions is not unprecedented, it is extremely rare and it reflects a sincere desire to identify the issues and address them. The Secretary and Undersecretary also approved and facilitated the addition of five former FBI special agents and civilian administrative support to provide much needed assistance to the team. We visited Fort Hood for 19 days in August and September. We conducted 647 individual interviews. We did 80 group interviews, which encompassed over 1,800 soldiers. And we conducted over 140 specialized interviews of various stakeholders on and off the post. We retrieved and analyzed thousands of pages of documents, commissioned 49 formal research projects, and conducted a survey tailored for this review, which drew over 31,000 responses from the Fort Hood community, representing what we were told is 100% of the targeted audience. The review focused on the period 2018 through 2020. However, if information from the last five years was, cons was considered, if it was deemed relevant to the review. After three months of diligent, diligent work, the, the committee issued nine findings and 70 constructive recommendations. The report leads off with finding number one, which states that the command at Fort Hood was ineffective in its implementation of the Sexual Harassment Assault Response and Prevention Program, the SHARP program. This was due to underemphasis of the program outside the three core headquarters and a failure to culturally integrate the program through the enlisted ranks to where almost 90% of sexual assault victims are found. The committee noted that while the Fort Hood leadership afforded the highest priority, to maintaining equipment, conducting field training, and ensuring deployment capability, a series of command elements executed these duties in a manner that was at the expense of the health and safety of all soldiers, but particularly for women at the brigade level and below. This dearth of command emphasis on the SHARP program adversely impacted mission readiness in terms of morale, reenlistments, and recruitments. The committee also found that soldier accountability was not strictly enforced and there was no missing soldier protocols for first line supervisors. This resulted in ad hoc responses to soldiers who failed to report and may have been in jeopardy. With respect to the crime issues at Fort Hood, the committee determined that the crime environment within the surrounding cities and counties is commensurate with, with similar size areas in Texas and around the United States. However, Serious crime problems on Fort Hood have gone unaddressed because the installation is in a fully reactive posture. Leaders across a series of commands failed to use best practices in the areas of public safety to develop and execute crime suppression strategies. The committee found that the serious crime problems on the installation at Fort Hood require proactive command action to mitigate. Fort Hood, the committee also found that the Fort Hood CID detachment had various inefficiencies that adversely impacted accomplishments of his mission. The committee wishes to thank the, Sec the Secretary of the Army, the Under Secretary of the Army, and the Army Chief of Staff, and the Army staff that they provided for the strong support they provided to this committee. So I just want to add that we were all fully immersed in all aspects of, of the review, but each of us had a focus area. So when you ask a question, uh, we may have that person come up to the podium and we'll switch positions. So bear with us as we do the switch. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swecker. We'll now take our first question, which goes to Lita Baldor, AP, on the phone. Hi, um, I had a question earlier, so I'll let someone else ask. Go ahead. Uh, Kyle Remfer, Military Times, also on the phone. Hi, thanks for doing this. Um, so we just heard that, you know, 14 senior commanders or 14 commanders there at Fort Hood were relieved or suspended. Um, but how far back do the problems that you guys identified go? 
Uh, is this something that just developed in the past 12 months, or does this extend, you know, um, years back here? How long has this been in development? Well, I'm going to refer to the report. We, we look back as far as early as 2014. Um, there, there were issues that were called out. If you look at it in terms of risk management, it became a known risk very early in the process. We did not fix accountability on any specific general officer or any particular commander because we, for that very reason, particularly in the last five years, uh, which was really the more relevant time period, we just didn't, it was, it, it was not an act of commission. These were acts of omission, if you will. These were things that were not done. These were not things that were done that were um, to the detriment of, of, the, of the soldiers, particularly the female soldiers. Does anybody else want to add to that? Okay, next question. Haley Britsky. Thank you. Uh, Haley Britsky with Task and Purpose. Um, in your conversations with soldiers and in your interviews with them, can you tell us about some of the points that you heard repeatedly, um, some of the concerns or complaints that they had <clears throat> regarding the sexual assault and harassment program? Yes, the, the individual interviews especially were pretty revealing. Uh, we interviewed 500, of the 647, 503 were female soldiers. What we found was that there was a fear of retaliation, all forms of retaliation, stigmatism, ostracism, career, uh, derailing a career, um, assignments, work assignments, and that sort of thing. Um, there, was, there was a fear and, and a, a founded fear that the confidentiality of the reporting process would be compromised. Um, there was a fear or there was a lack of, of any appreciation for the results or the response because the, it took so long to get an, an adjudication that people didn't, never saw the adjudication, so they lost, they lost faith in that. So there was, and, and I, there, there are other, many other things that came out of the interviews, if, if, as you will read in the report. But let me open it up to the other panel members. Does anybody else? Uh, yeah, I, I will say that uh, Keta and Kerry interviewed, uh, did the individual interviews, and they may have something to say about that, but they were very revealing. I just want to add that one of the things that the soldiers at Fort Hood, many of them needed, was to be believed. And that was what we did. We listened, and so if any of them see this, I want them to know we believe you. And that was a really, that's a really important takeaway, was to believe. That's all I wanted to add. As Mr. Uh, Mr. Swecker just uh, stated, um, I spent a bulk of my time during the course of the, our time at Fort Hood interviewing these individuals. Um, as he mentioned, 503 of the 647 were women. Um, we made a very concerted effort to interview every single woman within specific units, um, in particular the unit that Vanessa Guillen belonged to. And what we did discover was, which was one of the really shocking um, elements or parts of, of the interview period were the number of unreported sexual harassment and sexual assault um, incidents. Of the 503 women that we interviewed, we discovered 93 um, credible accounts of sexual assault. Of those, only 59 were reported. Um, and we also found 135, uh, I'm sorry, 217 uh, unreported accounts of sexual harassment. Um, so that's a really significant number of those, just over half were reported. And so what we discovered during the course of those interviews is that due to the lack of uh, confidence in the system, that lack of confidence absolutely affected, affects the reporting um, of those incidents. And obviously if we're not able to capture the, those incidents, then it's almost impossible to address that. But again, as Mr. Swecker alluded to, there were other indicators that this was a problem. Um, and so that's something that the report really focused on. And this interview, the interview period of all of those individuals really focused on just letting people speak to us. Um, they knew that we were an independent panel. None of us are on active duty, which I think was a very significant, uh, very significant in their willingness to speak with us and to just believe, as Ms. Uh, Ms. Richie just said. Thank you. Uh, next question will go to the phone. Jasmine Caldwell, KCN6, Texas. It's difficult for those of us on the phone. You probably want 
you to identify yourselves before you speak. Yes, um, panelists, if you could, uh, committee members, if you oh. could identify yourselves okay. before you speak, that would help the people on the phone. Good reminder, thank you. Uh, Jasmine Caldwell, did you have a question? Hi, yes. Um, of the, um, you were just talking about the reported sexual assault and harassment um, on Fort Hood. Um, out of the ones that were reported, were they properly handled? Um, we, it was all over the place in terms of adjudications. So in, when you say properly handled, um, the ones that were reported went through the process. If they were sexual assaults, they went through the criminal investigative division, a detachment there for investigation. If they were harassment, there, there was an appointed investigating officer out of the uh, brigade where the uh, complaint took place. What we, what we saw were, uh, and this, this may be an area where Ms. Ricci can, can address it as well because she was a former JAG officer and she concentrated in, in this part of it. We saw a lot of delayed justice, if you will, the old saying, justice delayed, justice denied. The process was so long and drawn out that most people never saw the actual result. So there was no deterrent, or, or at least there was no visible deterrent. Uh, we found that there were delays were built into the process and nobody was monitoring the life cycle of a sexual assault or sexual harassment complaint. So nobody really knew how long it took. Nobody had the responsibility to track how long it took or, or different parts of the process. Um, and that, let, me, let me ask uh, Ms. Ricci to come up and address that as well, if, if you will. Sure. Um, I don't have too much more to add. I will say that at Fort Hood, um, they have really organized themselves well to prosecute sexual assaults. They're not the easiest cases to try, and they have some expertise. Um, but what we found, as Chris mentioned, was that there are delays in the process that become uh, very troublesome for a victim. Imagine that you're still waiting for justice more than a year later. Um, so. I, I can't really add too much more. It's all in the report, but we did find some areas where um, improvement could be found. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I'm Therese Garnier with Newsy. I've followed this issue a lot uh, as far as sexual assaults in the military, and one of the things that I've found when I've interviewed different survivors and also former OSI agents were uh, one of the issues was they keep changing those who are investigating it. So you have one person who investigates and he's like, oh snap, I have to deploy. Let me pass this documentation to someone else. Now they have to pick it up. They're new to it. They don't know the case. And a lot of times that's what's dragging it on. And also a lot of evidence is being lost because of it. So what are you guys, uh, do you recommend uh, ways to fix that issue where you're not having multiple people investigating the same issue and just kind of passing it off from one person to the next? And so the report is very detailed about the criminal investigation divisions and recommendations. And on that, I will have uh, Mr. Swecker continue to talk on that topic because he did a very detailed review. Yes, thank you. So we, d we did indeed look at uh, the whole process. There, everybody has, there are different components that have a role. The JAG officers have a role. CID has a role. What we found within CID, and this, this may not G be just at Fort Hood, is that they were using Fort Hood as a training ground for CID agents. High turnover, uh, fairly chronic understaffing throughout the time period that we looked at, and inexperience. So very, of the 30, 45 a special agents assigned there, there were probably about 35, I think we determined, there were actually working cases. Out of those 35, there might have been three or four that had more than two years of experience. So they were rotating through. They were coming out of Fort Leonard, Leonard Wood, going straight to Fort Hood, uh, uncredentialed apprentice agents, and then within two years they were rotating out very quickly. So you, to your point, there was a lot of attrition uh, of the case agents and the agents working these investigations. Many of them were overassigned. Some of the investigative tools that most law enforcement agencies have, they didn't necessarily have at their fingertips, cell phone tracking, uh, uh, mirroring or extracting information from cell phones and mobile devices, which is very critical investigative techniques in today's investigations. Um, they needed more and better equipment and, and much faster turnover. There were delays in, in area, other areas as well when, when a pass off goes to the JAG officers or to the, to the command, uh, military justice, justice advisor. 
There were delays there in getting an opinion of probable cause. There were delays in getting an assignment of a victim counsel assigned to the victim. So all of that combined and conspired to make it a very long and drawn out process. Um, anyone else? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'm Cristina Londoño with Telemundo. Um, I was wondering how, how instrumental was Vanessa Guillén's family in this investigation and, and who talked to her? I'm going to hand the, the podium over to Jack White, who did talk to the family and has some perspectives for you on that. So uh, this whole committee was precipitated by the unfortunate events with uh, Specialist Guillen. And as we put together our methodology, talking with the family to engage in a two-way communication uh, was important to us at the outset. At the outset, we wanted to communicate to the family uh, that their perspective was important and that something was being done about uh, what they had experienced. But in looking at the culture, we wanted to hear from them about what their experience was uh, when their daughter was missing, uh, when the search was ongoing, uh, what were the interactions with the command. All of that is a component of the culture. So Ms. Ritchie and I sat down with the family, Mrs. Guillen, Mr. Guillen, their daughters, uh, and we talked for hours to understand what their experience was. Uh, indeed, uh, I spoke with Mrs. Guillen as recently as this morning to inform her of what was happening today and to assure her that the conversation that she had with us was meaningful. We learned a lot about their experience. Uh, and whatever we learned is reflected in the report and will not be lost. Were they happy with the recommendations that are coming through? Do they feel that it made an impact? Because that's what they were fighting for this whole time. Uh, I, I do not want to speak for them. Uh, I walked away from my conversation with Mrs. Guillen this morning believing that she is pleased that there is progress being made. Uh, I do not believe that she has had the benefit, that the family has had the benefit of reviewing the report and our findings and recommendations yet. Okay. Next question, we'll go to the phone. Matt Cox, military.com. Do you have a question? Yes, hi. Thank you for doing this. Um, I did have a question about, you know, your your findings on the uh, Fort Hood Criminal Investigation Detachment. Uh, you know, one of the big things of this was that the Guillen family, you know, said that um, Vanessa Guillen, you know, said she was told that she was uh, the victim of uh, sexual harassment and, and uh, possibly assault. And CID was very adamant that, well, we found no evidence of that. There was, you know, we found no credible evidence uh, of anything like that. Are, are you saying that that? you know, a, a flawed finding and that, you know, did you find, was there any evidence or, you know, that you found or can you speak to that as far as what that says, you know, what these findings about the CID detachment say to that, you know, that of whether she was, whether there was evidence that maybe had been overlooked. Does that make sense? That is the, the subject of a separate Army investigation, which is going very deep into that area. I don't want to step on an investigation. I will say this. There, there is a misunderstanding on one part of that. CID did not find any evidence that Specialist Robinson sexually harassed Vanessa Guillen. And I'll leave it at that. Um, because it's, we, we looked at the Guillen case as a case study in terms of the overall broader topic that we were looking at and the subjects that we were looking at. But once the, the separate investigation was announced, we did not, we, we are not the investigating body for 
uh, the issues involving the potential sexual harassment or, or any other issues involving Vanessa Guillen inside her unit. I'm not dodging this question. It's just a, it's an ongoing thing, and we don't want to taint that investigation in any way. Okay. Courtney? Uh, Courtney, if you do with anything today, you should just do follow-ons. Um, um, Ma'am, you mentioned a bunch of numbers about 503 uh, accounts, and I, I'm wondering if you could just clarify them, because you said there were 217 unreported accounts of sexual harassment. Is that correct? So, but then you also said that some, um, about half of them had been reported. Can you just run through those numbers again, do you mind? Yes, um, during the course of our interviews, it was 647 individual interviews that included both men and women, but there were uh, there, 503 women that were interviewed. Of those, um, night, we discovered 93 credible accounts of sexual assault. And again, those were just individuals of soldiers who were telling us that this had happened to them. Um, of those 59, when we asked the question, which was part of, part of the interview, did you report this or was it reported? The answer was no. Uh, I'm sorry, was yes, 59 of those. That's, that was the extent of those. For sexual harassment, we discovered 217 credible accounts of sexual harassment. Of those, and I'll give you that specific number that were actually reported. Um, for those of you on the phone, this is Ms. Rodriguez speaking. Yep. And all of these, this, these numbers, these specific numbers are included in the report. I think it was 135. There were, no, uh, it was, um, I apologize, I don't know the number. It is in the report, yes. Those specific numbers are actually um, called out in the report. And then, Ms. Ritchie, can I just get you to expand a little bit on what you meant when you said that people just wanted to be believed? Were people, were, were women not coming forward with reporting incidents and not being believed and not reporting a lot of what you heard? Um, it was two things. It was uh, cases where uh, there was either no resolution or an unsatisfactory resolution, uh, which happens. Um, and once it happens with one soldier, e every soldier in the unit learns of what's happening. And for the other women in that unit, it became a sense that they didn't believe us. Even if they served as a witness, um, we weren't believed. And then other women would say, because of what happened to this soldier, I wouldn't feel comfortable coming forward. So there was an overall sense that there is that reluctance to report, because who is going to believe us, especially for a junior enlisted woman, and especially one who maybe isn't their star soldier at the moment. There's that reluctance and that feeling that we won't be believed. And there were soldiers who just didn't report because they felt that. So just being able to talk one-on-one -on -one and to hear their very personal and sometimes very difficult stories, to be able to tell them and to, it was a little bit cathartic for many of them because someone was listening and they felt that they were being heard. So it was important to me to say, we heard you and we believe you. Uh, let's go to the phone. Carson Frame, Texas Public Radio. Are you on the line and do you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, essentially, it boils down to um, you, you've looked over the SHARP program um, and the criminal investigative response at Fort Hood. Um, how much would you say uh, of these issues are Fort Hood specific versus enterprise wide and Army, Army problems? Uh, this is Jack White. I'll start here. I'm sure that uh, Mr. Swecker will follow me. Uh, I want to start with our charter. Uh, our charter was to look at Fort Hood, and that is what we did. But we are not oblivious to the fact that, you know, this is one army, uh, and Fort Hood is potentially emblematic of uh, other things going on in the army. Sharp is an army-wide program. So some of our observations, while we saw them at Fort Hood, may very well uh, uh, be similar at other installations. A great number of our recommendations are Fort Hood specific. 
because that's where we were on the ground. And at Fort Hood, our methodology permitted us to kick the tires on just about everything uh, at Fort Hood. But some of our recommendations look beyond just Fort Hood because, uh, as I said, the SHARP program is an Army-wide program. Some of our recommendations in other areas uh, look beyond Fort Hood as well. Chris? John. Oh. Uh, this is John Harmon. You know, I agree uh, with what Jack has described, and it became very apparent uh, as we were going through the investigation um, and then afterwards that the Army was going to take these and apply them broader. And you heard from the Secretary and you heard from the Chief. And, you know, as Jack indicated, our charter was just to Fort Hood. But, you know, we have four of the five members on this panel have served in the military, two of us at Fort Hood. And so we know what it's like. And so we were very pleased to hear from the Secretary and the Chief about um, using this Army-wide. So again, our charter was focused solely on Fort Hood, but as Jack uh, articulated, and as, again, the Secretary and the Chief have said, they're going to use this to make Army-wide changes, which we, we applaud. And, and just, just to add to that, those 49 research projects that we commissioned went deep, and they made comparisons to other installations across the Army. So we, we weren't, as, as was mentioned, we're not, we weren't oblivious to what was going on at other installations around the Army. We made a lot of comparisons to how, how things were going at, 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 at other installations. And we also heard stories from soldiers who had served at other installations. So we, we did note, however, that in many cases Fort Hood was an outlier in things like AWOL, suicides, and, and other are other issues in comparison to some of these other installations. So there were, there were, Fort Hood was enough of an outlier uh, that we felt like we really, really had to concentrate on what we had in front of us. Sir? Hi, Yellow PD with the Univision. Um, we're talking about 70 recommendations, and Secretary McCarthy said that he's going to take all of them. Um, I would like to know what the role of this panel will be moving forward for accountability purposes to make sure those changes are implemented. So the People's First Task Force has been established. Uh, one of the colonels that we worked with very closely and supported us is the chief of staff for that task force. Uh, we'll be in touch with him, and he'll be in touch with us. And we will be, in some sense, uh, over, not overseeing it directly, but we'll be watching the implementation of, of these 70 recommendations. We didn't expect, nor, nor, nor did we ever uh, think that all 70 recommendations would be accepted. So that's, you know, that's a bit of a surprise, but I think it reflects um, a willingness on the part of the secretary, the undersecretary, and the chief of staff to, to fix things. Um, it was a risk to, to bring an independent review committee in. We recognize that. We could have gone anywhere and done anything. And we wanted to do this right, and we wanted to do this fairly, and, and we're very, we're very happy with the way the Army has accepted these recommendations as going forward. Uh, next question on the phone, Alex Horton, Washington Post. Did you have a question? Yes, I did. Thank you. Uh, you, know, you guys have spent some time focused on sexual harassment and assault. Um, I was curious if you were looking at other kinds of violence um, at Fort Hood to include um, you know, other murders, other, other high-profile incidents, um, including those um, you know, who, who disappeared and were later found dead. Um, and I was curious, uh, you know, what you have found in terms of Army culture um, of how, you know, the, the, the brand of AWOL and the brand of, you know, going missing um, contributed to a, uh, a lack of interest in finding them. Yes, I mean, that was a, a big focus of the, the review and the report. We looked at crime issues on the base. We looked at crime issues off the base. I think there was a perception really based on uh, media stories that there was some sort of crime wave uh, around the surrounding area of the base. What we found was that their, their crime rates in the areas surrounding the base were rel relatively low in comparison to other cities outside both major army installations but other comparable sized cities. 
Um, that's not to say that there weren't soldier victims off the base and soldier subjects off the base because there's a large population of active duty soldiers living off base, retired soldiers, separated soldiers and their families. So you're going to find uh, victims off the base. But what we found really was that on the base there were some hot crime areas that were relatively high, violent felonies, sexual assaults, sex crimes, drugs. Um, positive drug tests were the highest in the Army. So we, we found areas of crime on the installation that, if you compare them to, to civilian crime rates, might be low, but this is a military installation. It's a gated community. There are a lot of tools that you can use to suppress crime. What we found was that there was no proactive efforts to suppress crime, to address the drug issues, to address violent crimes. Suicides were extremely high. And what we found was that because CID was so inexperienced and so taxed for resources, they really didn't dive deep on suicides to find out why and what, what was happening that was the trigger for the suicide, the death cases. There aren't an, an anomalous number of death cases at Fort Hood um, in terms of homicides, but the homicides that, that did occur got intense media attention, and we looked very hard at those homicides. And again, what we found was in the death cases, uh, CID just needed more experience and more continuity inside the detachment there, and, and, and it may be a, a systemic across CID that there just isn't enough longevity at the post on the part of the investigators. So we rec made some recommendations regarding making sure there are experienced agents there, maybe going to more civilian investigators, and it's something we ask them to look at. Yes. Yeah, this is Jack White, and Chris is speaking to uh, some very valuable information on specific uh, criminal uh, the viewpoint from a criminal perspective. But something else that we did here is we looked at what is it that leads a soldier to behave in this type of manner. And in the process of looking at that, we looked, uh, one, of, one of the things that the report contains uh, is looking at the other armed services what they do well that might be able to be incorporated within what we do in the Army or what the Army does. And one of the things that we found is that one of the other services looks at the qualities in service members that lead them to violence, uh, the kind of violence that we don't want in uniformed personnel. And that fits that type of structure would fit well into an army structure that looks at the whole soldier concept, uh, the 21st century soldier. So we are looking at the criminal component, but we're also looking at uh, making soldiers more respectful of the contributions of other soldiers within their formation. And some of the other services do that well, and there are some aspects of what they do that we can bring in to what we do in the Army. Okay, question in the room, Mr. Glenn. Yeah, hi, Mike Glenn with the Washington Times. Uh, it's, it's one thing about to uh, relieve of, you know, for a bunch of colonels to, and generals to be relieved. Is there anything in the report about sort of emphasizing the responsibility of the first line supervisors, the ones who actually know something's happening, the squad leaders, platoon sergeants, platoon leaders, or, or, or because, I mean, they're the ones who, who would know, will know something's going on before a division commander will ever learn. Okay, I'll, I'll start there. Uh, this is Jack White again. The answer is yes. Uh, but let, let me take your question a little bit broader. Our question, our, our mandate was not focused on attribution. Uh, and we are very clear that the problem the problems that we saw are cultural, uh, and everybody is involved in culture from uh, the highest levels to the one-on-one -on -one interaction between the squad leader and his or her squad member. Uh, we address all of it, 
without attribution because accountability in that way was not our mandate. That said, yes, we focus on the importance of first-line leaders knowing their soldiers and knowing where they are. Indeed, uh, part of what uh, the DOD is focused on in you know this whole movement toward violence prevention and looking at the whole soldier is just that, those person-to-person -person interactions. And we address that in our report as well. Thank you. Let's go to the phone. David Bryant, Colleen Daily Herald. Are you on the phone? Do you have a question? Yes. Yes, this is Dave Bryant, the Clean Daily Herald, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, basically, what I'm wondering is, uh, have y'all made any recommendations to ensure that the lower-level units, such as your squads, platoons, and companies, actually comply with the recommendations that y'all have uh, y'all have made? Well, I'll let you. Actually, John, you want to address this one? Sure. So this, uh, I view this as kind of tying in with the question you asked a little bit about the first-line leaders. And when you have a chance to review the report in detail, you'll see, as Jack said and as Chris has said, there are a lot of uh, details in there that go to the squad leader and the platoon sergeant um, in this sense. When we were doing our interviews, both intervie in individually and from a group perspective, one of the things we heard over and over and over again from uh, platoon sergeants and squad leaders was that they did not have the time um, to really get to know their soldiers. And for those of us who had served in the military before, it was very, very shocking because uh, we, were, we grew up in a time when the platoon sergeants and the squad leaders had sergeant time. And they knew where their soldiers were, they knew their strengths, they knew about their families, and we heard that very, very frequently. So you'll see woven into the report, I wouldn't say that there is a specific accountability line directed right at the squad leader, but as you read the report, you will see that, um, as Chris indicated, with SHARP and with some of the other programs, they weren't being... Um, mandated down to below the brigade level. And that was certainly true with respect to the, uh, the platoon sergeants and the squad leaders who, because of the operation tempo, because of the requirements of maintenance and everything else, really um, were unable or did not take the time um, because of all the other requirements and because it wasn't emphasized to get to know their soldiers. Okay. And I, I will say, uh, just to add, I, I think that the Secretary and General McConville are very much on, on this topic. Uh, they've, they've taken some steps already. They took some steps even after the interim briefing to reemphasize the role of the NCOs and uh, non-commissioned officers, the first-line supervisors, in getting to know their soldiers. So if they happen to not report one day, they know exactly where to go to look for them because they know them well enough and they know what's going on in their lives. For those of you on the phone, that was Mr. White, followed by Mr. Harmon, followed by Mr. Swecker. We have time for one more question. Sig Christensen, San Antonio Express News. Are you on the line? Do you have a question? Got a no. Steve Campion, ABC 13 Houston. Are you on the line? Do you have a question? Yes, uh, Steve Campion here with ABC 13 in Houston. We've spoken to a lot of the families of missing soldiers there at the base, including Vanessa's here in Houston, and I wanted to see if you might be able to address this. So many of them have told us when a soldier goes missing there on base, uh, there wasn't a sense of urgency in finding that soldier. It was often seen that this person has gone AWOL. Can you give us a sense of what your review found in terms of that part of this equation, was there this lack of urgency to find soldiers who, who went missing there at base? There were two things that we think really impacted the, that missing soldier failure to report dynamic. One was, we, from what we saw, and, and actually the Gann case as a case study is an example of it, the, the accountability for soldiers at the first muster or, or the various musters during the day 
had slipped, particularly during COVID. So, and, and it, the part of that is a function of the NCOs um, not, again, not necessarily knowing enough about their charges, their soldiers under their supervision to know what was normal and what was not in terms of, of not reporting. The second part of it was with all the regulations and all the protocols in the Army and all the procedures, there was none for a failure to report. There are rules and procedures around AWOL and when to carry that as a status, as a personnel status. There are rules and procedures around when to carry someone as, as a deserter, when uh, to put, enter their names into the National Crime Information Center, NCIC, be on the lookout and that sort of thing. But there, at the front first line level, each NCO had to rely on their own devices and their own judgment and their own experience as to whether that failure to report was under suspicious circumstances or circumstances where the, where the soldier might be in jeopardy. And it, so it was a slippage of accountability, routine accountability, combined with no real protocols or procedures in place for the NCOs in the first instance. So, so I, we describe it as an ad hoc response. Each response was different. There were no consistent responses. They now have, and we have looked at the, the missing soldier protocol that they've, they've, uh, the Army has put out, and it's a very good one. It starts on hour one. In any missing person case, the first 24 hours is extremely critical. You can't get started 24 hours into it. You have to start on hour one, so an hour two. So that's where their missing soldier protocol that they're, they're promulgating now, we think, is, is, hits the mark. Thank you. That concludes this briefing. Um, thank you to the members of the Fort Hood Independent Review Committee for their service on behalf of the Army. Thank you. Female harassment, or is there other type of harassment? Mostly male and female.